Okay, I think we're ready to go. Welcome to the CNI virtual spring meeting. Uh, and I'm Joan Lippincott. I'm the Associate Executive Director Emerita of the Coalition for Networked Information. And we're so pleased that you could join us for this webinar today. And I'm really delighted to introduce Jennifer Nichols, who's Director of the Catalyst Studios at the University of Arizona. And she'll be speaking about catalyzing student success, how to center digital literacy, access to technology, and interdisciplinary communities of practice in innovative library spaces. I've been following the Student Success Zone project at the University of Arizona for a little while, and I'm really eager to hear about the various components and the progress that's being made, and in particular, help us understand an important concept that it's not just about physical spaces, it's about what happens in the spaces, about what we offer our communities and about the expertise that we provide. Um, we will be taking questions uh, at the end of the presentation. You can type your questions into the Q&A box at any point during the presentation. And at the end of the presentation, um, Jennifer will be taking those questions. You can also use the chat, but we have uh, some preference if you type your questions into the Q&A. And uh, we'll be putting any other, say, any links or other information into the chat uh, for you if, if something like that comes up. So um, I think we're ready and I wanna make sure everyone understands that this session is going to be recorded. And I hand this over to Jennifer now. Thank you. Thanks, Joan. Good morning from Arizona. Good afternoon for those of you not here. Um, it's a nice, cool, soon to be 100 degrees here. Um, so I, you know, I'm not the first person to say this, I'm sure, but um, I love presenting to an audience and having the interaction of you all. So this is um, a first for me to present without being able to see who I'm talking to. So I really look forward to um, the last few minutes when we can interact a little bit more. Um, so I've tried to, um, create an engaging presentation um, given the platform, as I'm sure many people have said before me. So, catalyzing student success suddenly looks very different than it did on March 1st. Today, I would like to talk about the Student Success District at the University of Arizona, the library's role within this, and particularly the role of Catalyst Studios, of which I'm the director, within that. There's no way that you're not all consumed with thoughts of what we should be doing today, this summer, this fall, this winter, amidst an unprecedented pandemic. It would be difficult to stand by plans to renovate space, create new positions, et cetera. Therefore, I want to situate what we have done within a thing that we now all find ourselves operating a learning space in the age of COVID-19. Today, I find myself reflecting on how our physical spaces are in some ways already irrelevant we carefully calculated how many people we could seat in our new spaces to ensure we were not costing our students anything in the way of access to quality study space. Now, we may be removing chairs at every table to ensure we're not contributing to the spread of a deadly virus. We're considering how to limit in-person access to future programs instead of how to attract as many users as possible to our beautiful new facilities. I desperately want to be here telling you about all the decisions we made that were economically sensical, what we learned from the lessons of our predecessors, why we should, you should do it the way we did it. And there are many things that may be relevant again in the not too distant future. But what seems more pressing is redefining student success for now. So ironically, perhaps I have this definition of catalyst on the screen. And as I edited this presentation as late as this morning, I've pondered how we are unchanged, what parts are unchanged, how the core principles of how and what we do have become more important than ever. But we'll get to that a little bit later. What I'd like to do now is talk about the project overall, for those of you who haven't heard about the Student Success District, what we started, how we're using that foundation to define student success specifically within the Catalyst Studios, 
Um, and we'll talk about the subtitle of this talk as well, Digital Literacy, Access to Technology, and Interdisciplinary Communities of Practice. Okay, so first, the Student Success District, um, as defined at the University of Arizona, is a joint initiative between the libraries, Student Success and Retention Innovation, Student Engagement and Career Development, and Campus Life Programs of the Provost's Office. Our goal is to encourage students to move seamlessly between spaces that provide a full range of services and support, helping them to reach their academic and career goals. Here is a rendering of the main library at the top left. Let's see if my cursor will. So this is, these three buildings are the main library. Uh, this is the Bear Down Gymnasium, as referenced by its roof. Um, this is the historic gymnasium of campus. Um, and then this is the uh, Albert B. Weaver, is that the correct? Albert B. Weaver Science Engineering Library, newly named during the Student Success District. Um, and then this is a new uh, four-story building uh, that's the Student Success Building. Um, so this interconnected district um, has outdoor patios and walkways that are designed for collaboration. There's meditation gardens. As you know, Tucson has exquisite weather for working outside most of the year. Even in these hot days uh, with plenty of shade, it's very easy to be outside and enjoying that space. So we're really trying to activate both the inside and outside space. And I'll tell you, um, it's, I think it will become more important than ever now. Um, so our goal really is to um, collaborate, co collaborate across support services, making referrals, making things seamless for students to facilitate discovery and encouraging them to be on site more. Uh, we often, as many of you probably experience in your libraries as well, have students who come in between classes um, to get work done and um, will settle there for an hour or two and then go on their way. So by co-locating these services, we're really hoping to leverage um, all of the service that is here to, to help students um, really be academically successful. So um, this dynamic space really helped us to take some of the things that we were working on in the past, and uh, I believe it was two years ago, um, I was at CNI presenting with my colleagues about some of the digital scholarship maker activities and data science activities that we had been piloting in actually in the science engineering library. And so we were able with the student success district to then um, take all of those pilots and all of the planning and move it into this dynamic new space to be able to really take advantage of all of campus wanting to maximally uh, collaborate um, so that we could serve students. Um, so I'll just say before I dive into Catalyst Studios that, um, you know, we had a lot of opportunities for the library's portion about what, what were we doing? What was the focus of our renovations? What, what were we trying to accomplish there? Um, and there's a lot of scholarship around why maker spaces in academia are important, what role they play. And my particular interest is really how having the makerspace within the library is even um, situated perfectly to maximally serve students in an equitable way. So um, I'm really excited about not only that we have been um, trying these things for many years and have a new space in which to try them, but that it is centered within the library and this library is centered within the student success district. So. Before I dive into um, Catalyst specifically, I wanna show you a little bit about what's happening um, in the library renovations in the district. Um, here is the entrance to the main library, um, which again was the, um, I'm sorry, I can't go backwards, here we go, was the, is the far um, left building. So this is the entrance to this building. This is special collections here, if you're following my mouse. Um, at, this is the west side, what we call the west side, and this is what we call the east side. Okay. Um, so this is the west side. Um, these renovations are being completed as we speak. Um, I haven't been able to see a lot of them because since the stay-at-home order, much of the work has become, um, has, 
has been able to be accomplished. Um, our goal was to open up during spring semester. So uh, the last time I rode my bike through and looked in the windows, it was looking um, fully furnished um, and ready to go. Uh, so for all intents and purposes, we are ready for folks to come back to campus on the west side, as far as I know. Um, so this is used to be, those of you who've been here before, this was used to be the reference stacks, uh, study space, and the liaison's offices. This is um, a grand staircase that go, connects the first and second floor to our information commons. So this uh, right side picture is the bottom floor. Um, and then this will be our tech lending area where folks can um, try technologies before checking them out. And um, also our computers and more study rooms will be down here on the first floor. Uh, this again is the west side. So we have a collection of study rooms of various sizes. These will be used internally as meeting rooms for our staff and librarians to meet with external stakeholders um, in these spaces, easy to find. And then they will be converted to study rooms for our um, students in the evenings uh, and weekends. Um, on the, this far right side are, um, are some of the tables and we will be mirroring the furniture on the outside. So um, both the inside and outside of the building will be activated for study space. Okay, and this is a rendering of the Science Engineering Library's new entrance. And this entrance is facing um, east facing the Bear Down Gymnasium and the meditation gardens and a lot of the wellness activities will be um, will be parallel to this space. Uh, what was nice about the Science Engineering Library renovations is we have a collaborative classroom in there um, that many classes um, that used to be large lecture halls of two to three hundred people um, are trying to activate their learning and have small group um, more active learning um, curricula. And so they're building specific spaces. We have the first one ever made. I'm sure there's been presentations at CNI about it um, within the Science Engineering Library. So we wanted to create more space for those students to then leave those classrooms and stay and study in the space and um, make a connection uh, between the first and second floors or the second and third floors um, in this case and, and open up the building. Um, that whole facade was all brick. So. Okay, so here is the entrance to the main library when you first walk in. Um, straight ahead are the, um, the information desks. Uh, they're, they're modular and designed to be moved um, in the future as necessary. Um, we have the hold shelf here and um, we're hoping to greet everyone and be able to send them um, to the various parts of the library very easily. Um, this space has been staffed since January through the construction. Um, we've learned a lot already um, in just those few weeks of being open. Um, here in the glass inside is the beginning of Catalyst. This is the data studio. Um, and then we'll go in there a little bit. So here, if you go past the data studio, this is the open study area in the middle of Catalyst Studios. Okay. So um, I just wanted to mention, for those of you that don't know, that um, we're talking about Catalyst Studios uh, with a capital C-A-T because we are the home of the Wildcats. Um, and so sometimes people will see it written out and, um, and then it'll click for them if they're local, uh, wondering why we named that. And for those of you who have ever um, tried to name a new innovation space, um, most names have been used before. So we had a, um, an interesting time trying to choose a name, but suddenly this seemed to make a lot of sense for us. Um, and I've been able to really think about the ways that the library is and has always been a catalyst. So I just wanted to mention that because sometimes people wonder why we spell it the way we do or we articulate it the way we do. Okay, so um, as you enter into Catalyst Studios, the first thing you see is this approximately 800 square foot data studio. Those glass walls um, completely retract so that they, we can expand the space. Um, there are tables and chairs for about 24 people in there. 
comfortably. We've been able to add um, up to 50 people with just chairs. Um, and it features a, a 4K, 6x3 data visualization wall. Um, this enables us to have multiple inputs. You can see um, our uh, data management librarian, I'm sorry, <laughs> specialist Fernando there, um, is using this in a way that many people use it, which is um, to ha have both their slides and their code up teaching in here. Um, but you can also maximize all of those screens um, for the 32 9 aspect ratio output. This is also outfitted for lecture capture. So as I've been thinking about um, maybe campus being open a little bit this summer, possibly open in the fall or even not, how can we provide these spaces perhaps for lecture capture for um, folks as we move more things online and how could this maybe be useful um, to that end, which again was not something that we thought of when we first planned this space. Um, the kinds of things that happen here are a lot of drop-in hours. Um, we had a lot of events planned for late spring that we didn't get to try out, um, and I'll get to those in a little bit. Oops. Okay, here is the green screen studio. This is within our Terry Seligman uh, VR AR studio. Uh, this is just much more picturesque than the, um, the, the rooms with the VR. Um, in them, so I chose to show you these. Um, this is a, a, a green screen cyclorama, and that really just creates a 3D backdrop for virtual production. Um, I hear that we are the second one in town only, um, so we have been um, working to understand the optimal lighting in the space. You'll see the picture on the right. Um, is uh, too much green light. If you try to Photoshop that, uh, there's too much green to get it all out. Um, and I wanted to show you all the picture of them dropped in the middle of the desert. The picture on the right is our president, Robbins, uh, the donor, Terry Seligman, our dean, vice dean, and uh, Robin Huff Eibel, who has been the project director for all of our um, renovations. And the project on the left is, a, um, is, is our student, Abby, helping a paramedic uh, instructor develop um, mixed reality lectures uh, where they're dropping in anatomical um, models and lecturing to the students in that way. And then here's the maker studio, which I find really beautiful. One of kind of the cornerstones of the student success district. Um, and it's again, the walls also open up um, both on the inside and then that far wall you'll see um, over here opens up onto a lovely patio. Again, I'm thinking about um, post COVID or in the next year when we are still very much within um, these considerations, how are we going to be able to use these outdoor spaces in new ways? Um, what is lovely about the Maker Studio is that it has reconfigurable workstations with fully articulating and movable tables and chairs. You see the projector there um, and has a sound system so that we can teach. And really one of the things that we wanted most was to be able to have um, purposeful instruction and still be a maker space. So in our previous space, we were very small. It was very difficult for us to both um, have a class in there and have people drop in and continue to use the space. So. Uh, we love this configuration and so far it's worked out very well um, with those intentions. Um, okay, so the stations that we feature in here, these are during the soft opening. So there's um, some things are, are not set up yet. Um, but we feature 3D printers, vinyl cutters, sewing machines, uh, laser cutters, CNC routers, uh, we have microcomputers, we have button makers, we have a letterpress, um, and many more um, other things. Um, we have a small staff. We, it's myself, an operations lead, a technology lead. We have 10 undergrad students and three grad assistants. And they really staff the space. Um, our space is open, has been open, and I, I'm sure this will change in the future, but it was open initially from 12 to, 12 to 8, Sunday through Thursday, 12 to 6 on Friday. Um, 
So as I said earlier, we're the first part of the student success district to open. And we were open for a total of seven weeks. We opened on Thursday, January 16th. Um, and our last day open to the public was March 6th uh, when we went on spring break. So in this time, we tried a lot of things. Some were very new, some we had piloted for years, um, and some things uh, were on the calendar and were not quite ready to, um, to be tried or were canceled. So um, um, again, I just wanna reiterate that what we're going for here in the programs that we host um, are really highlighting how we can build these communities of practice, how we can contribute to the interdisciplinary conversations, how we can increase digital literacy, and how we can increase um, access to technology. So here's a short list of the things that we've done. Um, let me make sure I'm not missing anything here. Um, so the certifications for use of the technology in the space, these are uh, run by the students who, who work in the space and um, we started with laser cutter certification, 3D printing certification, vinyl cutter certification, sewing machines, and we are just adding CNC when we um, stopped operations. And so what these mean is that a student um, has about, usually about five uh, to 10 participants, depending on the certification. People sign up ahead of time and they go through the safety protocols, the basics of operation, um, and then people get some hands-on time. Once they participate in a certification, we indicate that on their um, library record, and then they're able to book time through our LibCal system to use this space, um, to use the laser cutters, to use the 3D printers. Um, and some, th some things have reservations and some things are first come first serve. Um, but this also doesn't allow people to use them um, outside of our operating hours for um, safety and also for consideration of um, not only physical safety, but community safety and people feeling um, like they're supported in the use of, their, of the machinery. Uh, we also have drop-in hours and many of these things, again, um, we have been doing for a long time. Uh, these are primarily provided by others in the library uh, from other departments, librarians and specialists, and also other partners. Some of these partners are in partners in our student success district. Um, and we'll also have offices in proximity to where we are um, in when they move into the student success district eventually. Um, but many of these folks are really finding like the Adobe folks or the data visualization um, specialists who work in uh, research computing. Um, they're finding that having this space that is uh, central to campus and is open to everyone and really positioned in a way that anyone can have access has really been um, the best part, right? They can put up information online, they can say they're going to meet in their office, but by being visible in this space, um, they're really finding they're getting new kinds of um, questions, they're getting new people, um, discovering them, and that was really the goal, um, and that's really like the definition of student success for me was how do we co-locate these things so that people can find them and understand what is available to them as students um, or members of our community. Um, we did have several workshops, primarily around the topics in the drop-in hours. Um, we have a digital scholarship and data science fellowship. My colleague Jeff will be talking about that next week. Um, I encourage you to go to hear more about that. And that's really designed to build the digital literacy skills and build these interdisciplinary communities. And then those fellows will teach more content, more workshops um, within Catalyst uh, for the full campus community. We also host um, student clubs. Uh, I'm the faculty advisor for the 3D Printing Club, which has members across almost all colleges, over 100 members, more than 30 show up every week. Uh, so really trying to um, be the home for some of these student uh, clubs that do um, also address these issues. And finally, we're starting to pilot faculty fellowships. We'll see where those go in the future, but they're primarily for 
um, faculty who can use the space in unique ways for their curriculum and how might we help support some of the um, equipment that they might need. Okay. How am I doing on time? All right, so I just want to say that um, within those seven weeks, we were uh, we recorded 789 visitors, uh, which we're really excited about. That doesn't include participants to workshops that didn't walk in and sign in. That doesn't include everyone who walked in and didn't sign in. Um, so we know that we're on to something and that we um, really need to rise to the occasion and continue to meet the needs of the students, no matter uh, what happens in the fall, no matter what happens in the summer. So these are some of the um, things that the students have designed um, in this, during the stay at home orders. They've been teaching themselves more um, skills and then trying to understand ways that we can engage the community online better. So we've had some drop in um, times uh, like the woman trans femme craft hour we have a knitting hour on monday nights so we've moved online in ways that we can um, and we're also about to announce a new slack community for all of the community to engage with one another um, over the summer and see how that goes that way it's in place fully for the fall no matter what happens um, okay so Here's some more um, of the designs that they've made. So in closing, I really just want to remind us um, of, some, of some things that I've been thinking about around student success in this particular time. And I, I want to say that um, for me, it's always been, student success has always been, how can we include these new ways of creating and stimulating ideas and scholarship for everyone? I see making in our spaces as a new avenue for the library to reach students and a new possibility for supporting very important and disruptive ways of thinking. Uh, we talk about innovation all the time. We celebrate bold solutions, the non-traditional. We all know that Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs didn't graduate from college. So we need to challenge ourselves um, as we work in these institutions to do something different, right? Um, to think about how we're so accustomed to be oriented as cautious and conservative, thoughtful and deliberate, data-driven decision-making, evidence-based solutions. How are we going to challenge ourselves to continue to be responsive without being careless, to be risk-taking without being reckless, and try things that may not come out the way we intended? Um, I just want to acknowledge that there is no empirical data on the cutting edge. And while we seem to be explicitly reminded of this every day, I still think it's important for us to acknowledge that here we are on the edge together, even if we don't wanna be. And it's okay to keep trying to do these things. When we build these innovative spaces, um, we're gonna have to pivot, but how can we still be that core catalyst? How can we still return to the principles of making everyone as equally important and including them all in all the decisions that we make. So um, with that, I'll close and open it up for questions because I've been talking, I haven't been able to look at them. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so we can have a conversation. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, and you can leave your slide up if you like. Okay. Um, we're almost at time, so I want to let people know that we will continue beyond time for those who are able to stay online. And we do have one question, and then I have a couple, um, if you want to stay on, that I'd like to ask. Um, Stephen Bell asks, after the renovation, will librarians have their own offices, or did you create an open office space with no personal offices? So I know you talked about the staff being visible, et cetera, but can you talk a little bit more about that? It actually, Stephen has just um, added to that, the digital aspects of these spaces Okay, Let, let's go with the office one. Okay. That's actually separate. Uh, so yes, that was one of the um, things that happened. The librarian offices were shared offices, but usually two to three librarians. Um, now they are in shared open office space. Um, and we have a few different locations within the main library where um, everyone is located. Did you have any sense of how that was working in the short time that you were occupying them? 
Um, I think, you know, it was an adjustment for many people. It was very challenging. So one of the things that um, we did was create um, those small meeting rooms downstairs and prioritize that they would be used by us for our, um, for our external meetings. And um, so that was what we were planning to roll out later this spring. And so that we could, because so much was under construction, we had already gone through this contraction of meeting space in general at the library. So faculty and, and staff were struggling with that a lot during the renovations, just not, not having anywhere to meet anyone. So we were really looking forward to having more spaces to be able to schedule meetings that were very easily findable and having folks, uh, encouraging folks to have um, office hours in those spaces. And some people are having office hours in Catalyst um, so that they're very visible. But this, this Western side set of meeting rooms was hopefully going, we we're going to try and see if that addressed some of the needs of faculty and, and staff. Uh, Jennifer, before we get to Stephen's next question, do you have a slide after the one on the screen that shows your contact info? Yeah. Okay, if you put that up, thank you. Yeah. And Stephen's um, second question is, the digital aspects of these spaces tends to appeal more to grads than undergrads who are much more the focus of student success initiatives. Are you developing any specific projects targeted undergrads, for example, an introduction to digital scholarship, not just in, not just open workshops, but targeted projects that involve liaison librarians? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have, um, we have an initiative with the liaisons to start to um, identify faculty that we can work together to develop curriculum for, um, for specific courses and really trying to um, push beyond the very obvious connections and help people follow up um, with people who are interested in how can we um, do things a little bit differently within this, this art class or this math class or this English class um, and then help to develop in that way. I have an interesting project that I'm working on um, this summer with the undergrad, um, with an undergrad research um, project where um, they're fellows basically, and then they go through a whole summer intensive. So we're trying to figure out how we can pivot that a little bit online and do some digital literacy skills with them ahead of time. And that program is really focused on getting them the skills they need to get into graduate school. Um, and there's a lot of deliberate engagement, but um, since Catalyst is open, we started talking about how can we specifically support them. And then I do some work with um, incoming um, undergrads through Upward Bound programs. And we're gonna do, we were gonna do a week in the makerspace. Uh, we're now gonna do a week of design thinking and doing, um, and, and thinking about how we might apply in the fall when they can come in um, some of these um, technologies in new ways and start to have those conversations. Very interesting, thank you. Um, in addition to typing a question into the Q&A, if any of the remaining participants, and there are a number of you, would like to directly uh, verbally ask a question of Jennifer, you can go into the participants uh, section and raise your hand and uh, we'll, uh, we'll bring you into the conversation. While we're waiting to see if anyone takes us up on this, I wanted to ask, uh, it's a question and a comment. When I visited the Cabot Science Library at Harvard, uh, they had this really interesting feature where they had a big screen that faced in on one side and out because there was a really heavy, tra heavily trafficked area right outside that the entrance to the library so that they could um, show any instruction sessions or any programs that they wanted, um, both inside and outside. And I'm also thinking of the Virginia Commonwealth University Library renovation that has a really big screen on the outside of the library. I think it's above or next to the entrance where I think they're using it mostly for exhibit type information. But I just wonder if any of that is in the plans or if that's something that you think might be useful with your indoor outdoor environment. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. So um, what wasn't obvious from the photos maybe was the data studios at the very front of the library and that passageway, we have a Starbucks on the outside 
and it's a walkway between um, athletics, the entire athletic compound of campus, and um, a bit two big parking garages. So we see thousands of people walk past there, and you can easily see the data visualization um, wall through there. So what we have um, wanted to do is curate content from all over the student success district that can be on the wall when we're not teaching in this space. And then also helping instructors who use that space, if they're using the traditional, they're using it for their slides, you know, they don't need um, the full power of that wall. How can they make one half a slide that says what is happening? You know, this is um, a, a meeting of this group open to all, you know, come on in kind of thing, an invitation so people know what's happening and then use the other half of the screen to um, for their presentation. So we've talked about those things and started to curate content um, so we can run that because they are 24 hour screens and we definitely want to take advantage of how many people come and go. And then on the back side, we lost a little bit of space as we built out the room. Um, and so we have this display area and I've been working with a faculty who designs, um, he's an architecture and information faculty who designs installations. So we've been trying to design an installation uh, with projectors in that kind of display box so that we can out actually leverage that too. That sounds great. Can't wait to visit sometime. I would love to have you all. Thank you. Um, okay, I think uh, we're starting to lose people. I don't see any hands raised. Is that correct, Diane? And that's correct. Okay. okay. So um, I'm going to mention that if you look in the chat, you'll see a URL for the uh, slides from today. But in addition to that, we will have a recording available for all of you and one that you can also share with, with anyone at your institution and encourage you to do so. And I want to thank Jennifer for a really terrific presentation and for uh, giving us a, a, a great overview of uh, their new facility and the kinds of programming that they are developing there. Thank you, Jennifer. And thanks to all of our participants who've taken time out of their crazy, unpredictable schedules of, of recent days. I hope everyone stays healthy and safe and thank you for joining the CNI virtual spring meeting. Mm -hmm.